Welcome everyone. My name is Timothy Massad. I'm a research fellow at the Kennedy School and also the director of the Digital Assets Policy Project, a new project within the Mosavar Romani Center for Business and Government at the Kennedy School. I am delighted that our inaugural event is a discussion with Undersecretary of the Treasury, Nellie Liang, on the Future of Money and Payments Report, which was just released on Friday, along with some related reports. These reports were required by the White House Executive Order on Ensuring Responsible Development of Digital Assets, which was issued in March of this year. Under Secretary Liang, thank you so much for making time out of your busy schedule to join us just days after these reports were issued. I wanna start with um, what the report has said about central bank digital currencies. The report provides an excellent discussion of the current payment system and how it might be improved. And in particular, it provides a detailed, very thoughtful discussion of a central bank digital currency really one of the best I've seen. Now, it doesn't take a position on whether we should have one, but it does call for advancing work on a possible CBDC. The Federal Reserve issued a very short report on CBDCs last January, and it has said it is doing work on this already. But many have argued we are moving too slowly in looking at a CBDC. So, should we regard this report as calling for a faster pace, for more comprehensive work? Was there a perception that we weren't doing enough to explore this? Okay, let me start saying, first of all, thank you, Tim, for inviting me. And it really is an honor to be here for your inaugural event and this new, and this new project that, at the Harvard uh, Kennedy School. So I'm really pleased to be here. I thought I could start um, with an overview of the report um, and we'll get to the heart of your first question. Um, and then if I haven't answered it, maybe I'm happy to like take that back up again. Um, but I'd love to just, if I could take a few minutes to sketch out the broad framing of the report um, and um, okay. which we greatly appreciated input from many market participants, academics, policy makers, um, such as you, which fit many of the, all those categories. Um, so we greatly appreciate that. So um, been a terrific team at the treasury who's worked on this um, and across the government, we've engaged with many participants. Um, so let me just say, as you mentioned, this is one of the reports on the future of the US money and payment system, part of President Biden's executive order on ensuring responsible development of digital assets. And as you mentioned, this report was released last week along with two others, one on um, the current use cases for crypto assets that affects on consumers, investors, and businesses, and another laying out an action plan for um, uh, preventing these assets from being used for illicit finance. And I'd like to mention that next month, the Financial Stability Oversight Council, which the Secretary of the Treasury chairs, will issue a report on the financial stability risks of digital assets and um, any regulatory gaps. So to look to the future of money and payments, I'd like to just start with where we are today. Um, the current US system of money and payments has substantial strengths. The system has supported over a century of US economic and financial leadership, is capable of processing an enormous volume of transactions and is consistent with privacy and other democratic values. But clearly there is room for improvement. Some parts of the payment system are expensive and carry high fees. Other parts are slow and we need a more inclusive system. The percentage of people in the United States that are unbanked is higher than in all other G7 countries. Recent innovations in digital assets and other technologies could have significant implications for money and payments. And the innovations that we discussed mostly in the report 
include a central bank digital currency, a CBDC, retail instant payment systems, and stable coins. So a CBDC is a digital form of a country's sovereign currency. A US CBDC could serve as legal tender, be convertible one for one for paper currency, Federal Reserve cash notes, or reserve balances, the deposits of the Fed. It would clear and settle with finality and nearly instantly. Instant payment systems like the upcoming FedNow could also support faster and more efficient payments. As currently envisioned, it would use bank deposit money and settle in central bank reserve balances, which would preserve the core features of major existing money and payment systems. In contrast, stable coins aspire to be a new type of money supported by a novel payments technology with implications that are harder to predict. Um, a proliferation of stable coins or other new forms of private money that are not adequately regulated could pose risk to financial stability or undermine the singleness of the currency. And so with that backdrop, I'd like to just mention the four key recommendations we made in the report. And the first one, uh, which you already alluded to, is to advance work on a possible US CBDC in case it is determined to be in the national interest. So a US CBDC has the potential to offer significant benefits. It could contribute to a payment system that is more efficient, more resilient, and innovative. It could, could promote financial inclusion and equity by increasing access to the financial system. It could help support US global financial leadership as well as the effectiveness of US sanctions while also being consistent with privacy and other democratic values. In addition, a CBDC may help preserve the singleness of the currency, which is important for economic growth and stability. There also could be unintended consequences of a US CBDC, especially depending on how its design would affect private financial intermediation. It, would be a, it is a liability of the central bank. In some situations, consumers may prefer it to bank deposits, leading to a reduction in private credit availability. There could be destabilizing runs to US CBDC in periods of stress. In addition, because a CBDC would need to be extremely reliable, technological experimentation would likely need to proceed more cautiously than with private sector payment innovations. There are many important design choices to be made to achieve the potential benefits while minimizing the risks, and these need additional consideration. For example, a US CBDC could be wholesale or retail or use direct or indirect access models. Transactions could be tiered based on amount or counterparty type Further, there is need for more research and development on the technology to support a US CBDC, which experts believe could take years. So for the US to build the capacity, for the US to build capacity to adopt a CBDC, even as deliberations continue about whether one is in the national interest, the report envisions work in three areas. First, the Federal Reserve should continue evaluating the policy considerations that it outlined in its January 2022 discussion paper, as well as its research and technical experimentation on CBDCs. The report also suggests that the Fed provide the public with periodic updates on its initiatives. Second, Treasury will lead an interagency working group to support the Fed's efforts and to advance further work on a possible US CBDC. This working group will consider the implications of a CBDC in areas such as financial inclusion, national security, and privacy. The working group also will leverage cross-government technical expertise as useful for the Fed's efforts. Third, the leadership from the Federal Reserve the White House and the Treasury Department 
will meet regularly to discuss the progress of the CBDC working group and to share updates on CBDC and other payment innovations. The second recommendation of the report is to encourage use of instant payment systems. Retail instant payment systems transfer funds nearly instantly, as opposed to the multi-day settlement period that occurs on some legacy systems. In the US, examples include the Clearinghouse's RTP network, launched in 2017, and the FedNow service, which the Fed plans to launch in 2023. Global experience suggests that instant payments can make the payment system more competitive, efficient, and inclusive. Yet the potential benefits could be limited by certain frictions, such as inertia, slow adjustments among consumers, businesses, and financial institutions to change their habits or procedures to incorporate new technologies. In addition, these instant payment systems are generally accessible only to depository institutions. So to maximize the benefits from instant payments, the report suggests several efforts. First, the US government should continue outreach efforts around instant payments with a focus on the inclusion, with inclusion of underserved communities. Second, the US government should promote development of technologies that would allow consumers to more readily access instant payment systems. And third, in settings where appropriate, the US government agencies, which send and receive millions of payments a day, should consider and support the use of instant payment systems. The third recommendation is to establish a federal framework for payments regulation. This recommendation recognizes that non-bank financial institutions are increasingly providing payment services. They are contributing to competition, innovation, and inclusion. But non-banks that are not adequately regulated and supervised may pose risks to the users and the financial system. Today, oversight of non-bank payment providers is generally at the state level. And this varies significantly across states and may not address certain risks in a consistent and comprehensive manner. Accordingly, the report recommends considering the establishment of a federal framework for non-bank payment providers. A federal framework would provide a common floor for minimum financial service resource requirements and other standards that may currently exist at the state level. It also would complement existing AML, CFT obligations, the anti-money laundering and countering of finance terrorism obligations, and consumer protection requirements that apply to non-bank payment providers. A federal framework could work in conjunction with the US CBDC or with instant payment systems. It could provide oversight of firms that a US CBD system may rely on to provide a range of financial services. In addition, it could provide a pathway for non-bank payment providers to participate directly in instant payment systems. And finally, the fourth recommendation is to prioritize efforts to improve cross-border payments. Cross-border payments, those that go from one jurisdiction to another can take multiple days to clear and may have high fees. Indeed, it is one of the main impetuses for the development of much of the new technologies and efficiencies for payments. The report's final recommendation supports work to develop a faster, cheaper, and more transparent international payment system while considering the potential risks associated with greater integration of cross-border systems. It recognizes that the United States has a strong national interest in supporting global standards for cross-border payment systems that reflect US values, including privacy and human rights, consistency with AML CFT obligations and US national security. So just to summarize, we believe the digital assets and instant payments can transform money and payment systems. The report makes four recommendations 
we hope to continue to work closely with other parts of the government on these very important issues. And thank you, Tim, again, for inviting me today. Great. Well, thank you, Undersecretary, for that excellent summary of the report. And again, I, I strongly urge people to, to read it. it. It really is an excellent discussion of these issues, particularly with respect to some of the policy choices on a central bank digital currency. So let me just um, ask in terms of that, uh, because as I say, the Fed, Federal Reserve had already issued a report and is doing research, but some people have said we're moving too slowly on that relative to other countries. Did you, did you feel that? Did, the, did the, those involved in the report feel that? Is this a call to go faster or is it just endorsing kind of the, the road that the, the Fed has been on? Yeah, so I think the report, I think as you know, many countries, maybe nearly all countries are considering a central bank digital currency and it is at various stages. And I believe that they're all discovering there are very important policy objectives that any central bank digital currency would need to be consistent with. Um, but these are difficult choices and a need to involve a number of st policymakers, stakeholders. Um, I would say a CBDC, as I've mentioned, by definition is a liability of the central bank. And so it has significant implications for monetary policy. In that sense, the Fed is a key decision maker. Um, but it has implications for these other policy issues that I mentioned, um, the payment system, competition, financial inclusion, privacy, security. So it requires others to um, have input into the process. And the Fed has said it welcomes input on how CBDC could affect these other policy objectives. It also has said it does not want to proceed without broad public support, including from um, the executive branch and from Congress. So the report then recommends this working group, which would be led by Treasury, which would be to help gather expertise um, to support the Fed in its work and to ensure that these other policy objectives are considered. Um, in terms of, is it going too slowly? I think the Fed has issued a report earlier this year. It, it, the report encourages, this report encourages them to communicate more frequently with the public. Um, and the new working group will also establish a regular cadence of meetings and prioritize this work. Can you, can you say a little more about this new Treasury Interagency Working Group? Who will be involved in that? And what exactly, say, would you see it doing over the next year? Yeah. So um, we are, of course, in the process of, you know, getting more refined on what that group will do. But the primary goal is to complement the Fed's efforts and advance policy and technical work on the CBDC in case one is determined to be in the national interest. So there's a few areas where, of specific work that I could highlight. Um, as I mentioned, how a CBDC would be consistent with financial inclusion, national security, privacy, the trade-offs of privacy and say, um, anti-money laundering, CFT considerations. Um, it will continue to assess the merits of the CBDC, trying to incorporate what we can learn from others as they are also developing um, a CBDC. And third, it will try to bring together and leverage the cross-government technical expertise on digital assets that could be relevant for a CBDC. Um, in terms of who would participate, as I mentioned, there will be a regular cadence of meetings. Um, each of these issues could involve a different set of agencies or regulators, and um, I imagine that they would be brought in um, 
where their inputs would be especially valued. You mentioned that it could take years before we have a CBDC if we decide to have one. And it's obviously hard to predict what the path will be until we do this research and development. It's hard to know exactly when we will have arrived at the point where one can make a decision. So what milestones do you foresee? What, what metrics will measure our progress? A great, great question. Um, I think there is a commitment by the Federal Reserve and the administration um, to inform the public about ongoing work. And um, there could be pilot programs that would offer an objective metric. Um, but I think the communication is probably the best way to monitor progress. Um, as I mentioned, a CBDC is not like, because of the necessity of super resilience, let me just call it super resilience, right? Like you, the, um, it has to be more resilient than a private provider could provide um, or needed to provide. And so it would, it needs to proceed cautiously. Um, and, I expect that it will test out various features over time. And um, some could be shown through communication, others could be illustrated through pilot programs and uh, of which the results could be reported. You've, I'm sure, looked at what other countries are doing and thought about that. Do you have any sense of what kind of budget we should have in terms of this research and development effort? I mean, does anyone have a sense of order of magnitude for that? Um, we didn't get into the details of that kind of, of that effort for this report. Um, I think that is also part of the long time horizon. Mm -hmm. Also governments looking to the private sector for their innovative, energies and, and new projects and ideas. Um, I do know, you know, some countries have looked to the private sector to take on a role for a specific experimentation about a piece. Um, I do not know what the budget is, um, but so we did not get into, get into that issue. You mentioned the private sector. Maybe we can talk for a minute about that. I mean, some of the research certainly is driven by technology. Everyone can agree on the goal, like a CBDC should be privacy protected, meaning we don't want the government knowing or collecting massive quantities of data about all our transactions. On the other hand, some of the issues, as you've noted, are involve more complex policy trade-offs. Um, how will it be distributed? What's the role of banks? What's the role of non-bank payment providers? And you know those questions involve uh, important public policies and difficult trade-offs, and they affect different market participants differently. I don't. I'm not asking so much about those issues. I think the report does a terrific job talking about them. But how do you think about the process, particularly maybe the, the Treasury Interagency Group, in terms of working with the private sector? Um, do you foresee private sector participants on some sort of advisory group, or do you, do you perceive it more as just you know, interaction where it's needed on particular issues? How, how, how do you envision this Treasury Working Group uh, working with the private sector on these issues? Yeah, um, first I would say we highly value private sector input on policy issues, not just on technological or experimentation. Okay, so just to be clear on that. We did not get into the specifics about establishing formal um, arrangements. I think 
I think that there's no doubt we will turn to look to private sector for views. Um, but whether it will be formal, informal, I think those are all issues that are still to be still to be discussed and worked out. Mm -hmm. Well, perhaps we can move to the, um, the, the broader subject of payments. As you noted, um, the third recommendation is that we establish a federal framework for payments regulation. Although I, I would note that the text later says Treasury recommends consideration of the establishment of a federal framework for payments yeah. regulation. Um, so, you know, this is a very important subject. Uh, I think it's it's great that the report addresses this. I mean, just as a, as a bit of background, and you talked a little bit about this, we've traditionally had a system where banks are the principal providers of payments. And of course, they do other things like credit creation and taking deposits and so forth. And our regulatory system has given them uh, certain advantages. It's also regulated them on all those things. This report talks about how we are increasingly seeing non-bank providers potentially uh, in this space and being able to do it. So tell us a little bit more about that recommendation and maybe what, what will Treasury be doing to advance that recommendation? Are you calling? Do you envision proposing legislation or is it too early for that? Um, so I think you're raising a pretty important, what we think is an important issue. We're at, you're emphasizing what we think is an important issue, which is um, payment services, the unbundling of financial services, what used to be provided by a bank, which was both liabilities and, you know, providing payment services and lending at the same time. Some of these products are being unbundled and we're getting different kinds of financial service providers. And um, um, and they are becoming larger. And so the current system may not be appropriate for this new financial landscape. Um, so we recommended this to consider. The current framework looks at federal payments as state money transmitters. Um, I would say stable coins also are generally regulated at the state level as money transmitters. That regulatory regime um, was not really designed to think about the macro risks of broader larger payment providers that do more than just provide transmit money. So that was, we currently have a state system, different standards by state, which may be appropriate for those states, but this, this set of firms and provision of these activities have gotten larger and, um, more, and more complex and could have more macro implications. Um, so I, in that sense, we thought we would consider, is it too early? I think it's important for regulators, state and federal to consider their own set of authorities right now and review that. And could you develop a scheme that would provide the appropriate oversight? Um, I think it hasn't been elevated as a primary objective yet, and now maybe it's perhaps they could get there with their existing authorities for payment providers. I would just mention though, but we do not think that is the case for stable coins. Stable coins are different than say um, standard payments uh, that currently exist that may work through the state uh, regulatory system may work through the banking system. Stable coins are outside and we do think you need legislation to address those issues. So on that point, um, obviously we had the report of the president's working group on financial markets together with the FDIC and the OCC last November on stable coins. That report called for legislation to regulate stable coins. Uh, 
this report understandably doesn't repeat all of the things that were said in that report, but how do you think you're doing on that issue? How uh, are we making progress toward that? And yeah. I take it that you, what you are saying is you want to see stablecoin legislation. And even though that is one type of non-bank payments, the broader issue of sort of a, a payments framework, if you will, is kind of second to dealing with stable coins. Is that a fair statement? Yeah, I think um, we have different kinds. As I mentioned up front, we have a number of different innovations in payments that could, we think should be looked at in terms of all of our policy objectives, including financial risks. So first is the CBDC, second is the instant payments, which is building on um, the existing infrastructure at, at which current non-bank payment providers as well as bank payment providers could be operating. And third is stable coins. Um, stable coins are new technology, perhaps a provision of new types of money. They're a bit more complex than the existing system. I think we identified run risk, payment risk, potential for um, disrupting a single uniform currency and believe that legislation is needed to address those, that the current authorities of the financial regulators is not sufficient to address those risks. I think we are not there and we consider exploring, do, could the risks of non-bank payment providers be addressed under current authorities for state money transmitters and other authorities that might exist. So I, we have not recommended legislation um, at this point. It is less clear, but it deserves, it'll be definitely part of, uh, that is the point of raising this for consideration and to, um, um, you know, and promote discussion of this issue. Okay. Which I'm sure you will have many thoughts. <laughs> so I just said. <laughs> Happy to always share my I, thoughts. Yeah. Thank you. Um, maybe we could turn to the international uh, implications of some of these issues, particularly with respect to a central bank digital currency. Do we need a CBDC in order to preserve the global role of the dollar? And if we're not in a position to answer that today, is that something that the treasury working group would address or is that more of a Fed question? And do we need a CBDC for other international objectives, national security objectives or sanctions or so forth? Mm -hmm. How did you all think about mm -hmm. those issues? Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's our, um, it's a, raises a whole set of very interesting questions. So there have been observers who suggested that um, a U.S. CBDC is needed to preserve uh, U.S. global financial leadership, um, arguing that efficiencies created by foreign CBDCs or potential foreign potential CBDCs could create competition for the dollar. Um, I don't, I'm not in that camp in the sense of, I think the prominence of the dollar reflects many factors beyond payment system efficiency. Um, these include, you know, the strong economic performance of the US, sound macro policies, its institutions, its liquid, deep and liquid financial markets, uh, rule of law, institutional transparency, free floating currency, there's a long list. I think those are all critical to what supports a global, a US leadership and the role of the dollar. Um, that said, you know, um, the US should be considering a CBDC. Um, and over the long run, one could imagine some financial and economic decisions could be tied to the technological efficiency of 
of the payment mechanism of the asset, the bearer asset, and it could be tied to the convenience. So one could imagine, depending on how the digital world evolves, um, there could be some value to technological compatibility. Um, and so, but currently I just, just do not think that is what is, is crit, that it's a, you know, among the top list of factors that support the role of the dollar in the, in the US. Um, so, but we all have interests, of course. Um, our, the, the work by the US on developing this and, and establishing standards that we believe are important for a CBDC, I think also helps us in our engagements with other countries and their discussions of, of CBDC. So I think it's important whether or not we determine to issue one ourselves for this country, it's important to be engaged in that discussion and to promote uh, values consistent with, with uh, US values. Let me turn to the um, access to financial services or financial inclusion issues. You, you mentioned these at the outset, that the payment yeah. system doesn't work that well for many Americans, uh, those in the uh, lower uh, segments of the income distribution ladder, let's say. Um, some have said a central bank digital currency could be a great asset, particularly if we did some sort of retail version, even had uh, accounts, individual accounts for people at the Federal Reserve. Uh, the Federal Reserve in its report um, basically said it wasn't real crazy about that approach. Um, how much of this, I mean, just stepping back, when you think about the challenge of access and financial inclusion. And obviously the treasury is doing other things on the, in this area. How much of this is a technology issue where we need faster systems, better systems, easier systems that one can use on your phone? Mm -hmm. And how much of it is a regulatory issue that maybe we just need different rules, either making it easier vis-a-vis -vis know your customer requirements or mandating uh, banks to provide uh, accounts to people uh, with, say, a certain level of services, or even something like what Brazil is doing, where they have um, basically mandated a common application uh, that all financial providers must use called PIX uh, that they believe will really yeah. enhance financial services. So how, how do you think about it, the sort of technology versus maybe it's more regulatory policy issues in terms of financial access and inclusion. Yeah, so um, you're highlighting a really important facet of our current payment system, which is um, lack of financial broad inclusion. As I mentioned in my comments, the US has the highest percentage of households individuals that are unbanked of across all the G7 countries. It looks as if part of that, I mean, surveys suggest one, it's due to both lack of trust in banks and two, um, high fees. So to the extent that new payment systems can overcome those factors, it can help quite a bit. So, um, so I think to increase financial inclusion, you could use both a real-time real instant payment system or a CBDC. It's even possible stablecoin could do it if all three reduce the costs of transactions. And that's the promise of some of this new technological innovation is lower transaction costs. And I think over time, as this technology, you know, we want to allow the technology to develop and see if it could achieve that. Um, on the other hand, okay, so I have to say it on the other hand. Um, on the other hand, you know, the new technology suggests that these, you know, it, it, it 
it solves this problem only if the consumers who are not using banks, what we call the unbanked or underbanked, have access to technology and are comfortable with technology um, and using that for their payment. So I think there's, my view is it can help inclusion in the sense that it is going to reduce fees. It certainly should make it easier for it to increase access for those who want to. Um, but I think there's a number of different ways to, to sort of try to um, approach this problem. And as you know, currently banks are providing some services, some deposit, no fee, low cost kind of services. And I think that is help, helping too. So it doesn't, it doesn't, it's not, you know, the solution is not only here, but we certainly want any new developments in this area in the technological aspects of how payments could be provided to be consistent with promoting more inclusion. Great. I'd like to turn to the consumer protection report yeah. that was also issued. Um, and that report discusses the crypto sector broadly. And it concludes that the crypto sector is rife with frauds, thefts, and scams. Um, but on the other hand, it doesn't recommend any new legislation or new authorities. And of course, there are some proposals that have been introduced in Congress to do just that. Does that mean you aren't in favor of any of those proposals? Does it mean you agree with Chairman Gensler's view that he says he doesn't really need any new authorities, he just needs people to obey the law? How do you think about those issues? Yeah, so um, thanks for raising the Section 5 report, what we call our Section 5 report, that's, which is um, that part of the executive order. Right. Um, that, was, that report is focused on, and just let me set, distinguish a little bit, um, crypto assets, which are a subset of digital assets in the sense of we exclude CBDC from that discussion. So this is current crypto assets. Um, the other thing we focused on in that report are current use cases, like the here and now. How are consumers using it? What kinds of effects are they having? What do we observe in terms of uh, use cases for crypto assets currently? And as you alluded to, um, you know, one of the main findings was the major use of crypto assets is for trading and some lending and borrowing, mainly in the crypto asset space. Um, while there are lots of potential use cases, and we don't want to downplay these potential use cases, but they haven't yet materialized. One could imagine, you know, um, financial services firms using them to, you know, to improve their efficiencies internally. It could lead to greater tokenization of assets. There's all kinds of efficiencies that could improve payment clearing settlement services. But currently it's trading, it's lending and borrowing. And as we discovered, and as, as well documented by many, but we do pull together quite a bit of the information in one place, um, there is misconduct, there's lots of instances of fraud and theft and scams. But we did also um, working with our with the agencies, come to a view right now, currently, that U.S. government has many authorities to address the unlawful activity and to protect investors and consumers. And that, so the first recommendation is to have them aggressively pursue their investigations and bring actions to enforce all applicable laws. I think that reflects, one, the efforts that the agencies have already taken and the successes of many of those. As you know, like the SEC has had 80 plus cases, you know, the CFTC and FinCEN and others have worked together and brought enforcement activities and assess monetary fines. But it also reflects the urgency of um, to, in the here and now to protect consumers and investors. And so I think that's the first recommendation. 
The second, though, is to review existing authorities carefully, um, design guidance, and to work collectively. These are, it's technology, but they're providing financial services that have always been provided in some form or another. You know, there may be a different activity, but generally they're trying to provide, they're either an investment or they're providing a payment service. We do have existing regulations for those kinds of financial activities and to protect investors and consumers in the provision of those activities. And it could be that collectively regulators may even have more. So that is the um, second recommendation to um, clarify authorities for themselves and for the public and enforce compliance um, and to look at collectively whether they could. Now, all that said, all that said, as I mentioned up front, um, there's a fourth report another report that will be coming out in October, which will look at not just the consumer and investor protection issues or the illicit finance, but the broader financial stability risks that might be associated with digital assets. And are they creating vulnerabilities in the financial system that could create broader um, risk to the whole financial system, to the macro and the real economy? Um, and there to identify regulatory gaps. So I do think there is, um, there will be additional work to, to look at are these creating new areas of intermediation, new types of intermediation that create different vulnerabilities that are not covered by current authorities. Um, but that work is ongoing, and um, as you know, we can never get ahead, ahead of our, you know, get ahead of that process. So um, I think that's part of the should be is an important part of the discussion. So, insofar as you will be looking at regulatory gaps and whether there's a need for new authority, I, I take it what you're saying is you, you haven't made a decision on whether some of these proposals that are circulating in Congress are ones that yeah. administration would want to back. Yeah. And, and would that work then, will that work be led by FSOC or by the treasury or by the president's working group or what, what, will, what do you envision there? Yeah, um, so that report is a FSOC report. Right. Um, it does not mean that FSOC has to lead all the all the work that comes out of the recommendations, mm -hmm. but I think it will depend on the recommendation. Um, and some could be, you know, directed at regulators. Some could be, um, suggests that legislation is needed. I think there's still a range of possibilities. And that report will be out in a couple of weeks? Um, beginning of October, near the beginning of October. Great. October, the month of October. Let me say it that way. <laughs> don't, again, don't want to get too far ahead of. Uh... Okay. <laughs> um, there is also a section that talks about illicit finance and discusses mm -hmm. the risks of illicit finance with crypto. And here, of course, the Treasury through uh, FinCEN has done, I think, great work in terms of developing standards and trying to apply those. And of course, the participation in uh, international uh, fora, such as the Financial Action Task Force, there's been a lot of work there. Um, and the report makes several recommendations uh, about continuing that work and new steps that are needed. I don't wanna so much get into those specific recommendations, or even the issues of, you know, how well can we trace transactions on the blockchain yeah. or what's the effect of software that can disguise identity? Obviously we had the whole issue with Tornado Cash, which I won't ask you about because I know it's in litigation. Because it's in litigation. Thank you, appreciate that. <laughs> but I, so instead, I, I, I sort of want to ask you about uh, whether the government needs to articulate more of a first principle here. And let me explain what I mean. I mean, traditionally, we've had a financial system where the government can identify the parties involved in a transaction if it needs to, 
and if it complies with appropriate legal process, meaning it has cause, it gets a subpoena, a warrant, or you know whatever the rules require. Um, at least if the transaction is conducted electronically as opposed to maybe suitcases of cash, that's a little different. Um, you know, we've had very strong know your customer rules and other procedures. I mean, Congress even applied know your customer rules to antiquities dealers fairly recently. So is it time to, to articulate that the same principle needs to apply to crypto? In other words, that the government should have the ability where there's cause and where it complies with appropriate procedures that protect people's rights and reasonable expectations of privacy to identify the beneficial owner of any blockchain address. There should be systems for doing this. This, this technology and this industry should not be beyond the reach of government. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, so I think, Tim, we've have articulated a principle that to the extent that new technology is offering financial services that have always been offered, but it's being done in a new form. It does not mean it is not subject to the same regulations. So in other words, um, regulations should be technology neutral. And I think that is the case with digital assets and illicit finance. Um, you know, Treasury began looking at, and they call it virtual assets, just for those who read all the, all the uh, guidance from, from that group. They've been looking at this area since, um, has been issuing guidance since about 2014. And, um, and they've been ramping up and, um, I would say that they are absolutely approaching this with this is an activity using money in some form or assets in some form for financial crimes, for money laundering, uh, for terrorist financing, and they should then be subject to the same responsibilities and should be subject to the same penalties and fines. So I, I absolutely agree with you, Tim. I think there, there's some interesting work. They've been doing um, really interesting work in this space and have been following the use of crypto technology um, for, for um, money laundering for years. And every year, they put out a national risk assessment every year. Maybe it's every two years, I'm not sure. It's, it's frequent. Um, and they, and I would say they've been clear that digital assets for money laundering is still well below the level that, that fiat currency or other traditional assets are. I mean, there's just cash is still the most private uh, transaction medium, right? Um, but it is growing. And so trying to make sure they are in a position to counter this growing trend, especially if these assets get, you know, used more and more broadly and become more and more mainstream, um, they want to be in place to do that. And I think their approach to these rules are very much same same financial service, um, same regulations, technology neutral. So would fully agree with you. Um, let me step back for a moment. I, I was thinking about the fact that over 200 years ago, Alexander Hamilton, I think single-handedly wrote a report <laughs> calling for the creation of a national bank of the US. And you know that report dramatically shaped the evolution of our government uh, and, and our financial yeah. markets. And it spoke mm -hmm. in a very forceful way. Now, of course, we live in a day and age where government reports aren't quite, you know, they're not produced that way. They're committee reports. I commend you. I'm sure there were a lot of cooks stirring the pot <laughs> on this report. It's often hard then for the recommendations to 
speak with the kind of forcefulness that yeah. Alexander Hamilton mm -hmm. would use. That's why we have, you know, you know, consider establishing a national payments framework. But stepping back, do you think this is a turning point? Do you think what what do you think will be the impact of the report? Or is it just sort of setting the table here? And what's important, of course, is what happens next in terms of the work that uh, the Fed will do, that the Treasury Interagency Group will do. I mean, how do you think about that? Yeah, so um, hard to predict. So first, it's hard to predict the future. I'll always start with that caveat, and I, uh, especially here. I think there is, you know, the, the executive order was written with the intent to recognize that there are potential benefits to this new rapidly changing technology, but it is clearly raising concerns among households, investors, and there's clear evidence of fraud and thefts and scams, et cetera. And how can, what is the responsible way to allow this to develop? at the same time mitigating risks, current risks and potential risks, right? So we have all the current risks that we've highlighted, consumer, investor, illicit finance, but there's potential risks too from different payments and different technology. Um, it is hard to um, predict how far reaching the implications of a central bank digital currency are it's hard to predict how far reaching the implications of tokenizing all financial assets might be. Um, it will depend a lot on the success of this technology, whether it can be environmentally friendly, whether it can really reduce transactions cost, can it really be efficient? All those, with the proponents uh, put out all the benefits, they're still being tested. And, um, but if they come to pass, one could imagine some significant gains. And so I think um, we've learned through history, maybe Alexander Hamilton, a hundred years later, there was, we learned that there's some benefits to a uniform currency. It's good for economic growth, stability, financial stability. So we're gonna try to like, we lay down that marker, whatever happens, we want a uniform currency. Um, you know, and we laid out a marker of it's important to prioritize national security while at the same time ensuring privacy of individuals. And so there's important trade-offs. Um, where it's all going to land, Tim, I, I don't know. It'll be very interesting to um, follow this progress. And I think it was important to put, as you say, lay the table, but it does lay the table and sets out the next step. And I think we don't want to jump too far ahead on the next steps. We do need to let um, technology, the public's comfort with technology um, evolve and see where that goes. I think there's a big public element of what they want for their future as well. Well, one final quick question. One of the things the executive order sought was to develop a an across the board strategy here. And I'm sure you haven't talked about it, but I know there are a lot of people and agencies involved in this report, at least within the executive branch. Uh, do you feel like, you know, people are coalescing and they're agreeing on a direction forward? I think everyone agrees on the direction forward. I think the pace at which you should move in that direction may differ. Right. Um, and, but I do think, you know, there's fundamental questions that we don't have clear answers to. And, um, and without that, one needs to just keep moving, just sort of keep moving down the field, just so to speak. Um, right. Under Secretary Liang, thank you so much for spending an hour with us. This has been very informative. We really appreciate your time. Any final words you'd, you'd like to close with? Uh, no, so thank you, Tim, and good luck on your new um, project. I think the idea of a digital assets program is uh, very exciting. Also suggests that 
there's quite a bit in the private sector, um, not just the governments, uh, thinking about the potential and uh, look forward to uh, learning a lot from you and your program. Well, great. Well, we'd love to get you up to Harvard in person to, uh, to share your thoughts with us. So I may be back in touch with you on that. Thanks so much. Thanks.